Welcome to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. What is the United Nations Democracy Fund? What is the fund doing to promote democratic activities in several areas around the world? We'll be back in just a moment to talk about these and other important issues. Welcome back to our program. Today we're going to take a look at the United Nations Democracy Fund and what it's doing to promote democratic activities in many areas around the world. My guest today is an expert on the fund. My guest today is Ms. Annika Saville, who is the executive head of the UN Democracy Fund. Prior to joining the United Nations, Ms. Saville had a 15-year career as a journalist, serving with the Associated Press, Reuters, the Independ Interdependent, Independent, my mistake, where she was a founder, member, and diplomatic editor. Annika Sava, welcome to today's Global Connections program. Thank you for having me, Bill. I appreciate you being with me today. Let's start at the top. What is the United Nations Democracy Fund? When was it started? Why was it started? What is your main mission? The UN Democracy Fund is one of the youngest entities in the UN system. It's about 10 years old. It was founded in 2005 by Secretary General Kofi Annan at an initiative that was really undertaken by the United States and India, the world's largest democracy. Those two countries wanted to do something multilaterally to advance democracy around the world. However, this should be understood to be democracy in a very grassroots sense, as the main purpose of the fund is mm -hmm. to support projects conducted by civil society organizations, not by governments. In that way, the UN Democracy Fund is also the only entity that funds civil society and not mm -hmm. states. Mm -hmm. Now, democracy can mean many things to many people. When you say democracy, there are various types. There's no one, no one specific type of democracy, is there? There are uh, different types, uh, be it Australian democracy versus Japanese versus uh, whatever, uh, Chilean <laughs> or the United States, whatever. But it, uh, how do you define democracy? First, I have to give the standard United Nations answer that there is no one size fits all. There is no model that can be imposed by one part of the world on another. What I have to say also is a rather more gloomy way of looking at this question, which is that today many things masquerade as democracy <coughs> but are not really in the sense that we want to understand it. We have competing authoritarianism. We have multi-party systems that are very weak where one dominant party really stays in power decade after decade. We have um, rulers that are supposedly democratically mm -hmm. elected but keep extending their term limits. Um, all these models are really the more predominant ones today. You will find if you took a numerical survey of that, that, that would be the best. Mm -hmm. Most mm -hmm. states, in fact, find themselves in the gray area between consolidated democracy and dictatorship. Mm -hmm. And very few are on their way to full-fledged democracy. Now, uh, you mentioned many countries, U.S., India, various countries, are promote, they have democracies, they're promoting democracies in other countries. The U.N. is a sp supporter. Why is it important to have democracies? It, it, what are the advantages of living in a democratic society as opposed to maybe one that's more authoritarian or totalitarian mm -hmm. or whatever it might be? If you look at the really prosperous, stable nations of this world in the long term, they all have one thing in common, which is a sense of participatory uh, engagement by their populations. And I don't just mean voting. Um, to, to go to the polls every four years is by no means. It's really a from the ground up sense of ownership in the progress of your country, which obviously then includes civil society engagement. What do all these nations have in common who have been now year after year, decade after decade, functioning well is that. And you will find that that's really what they have in common rather than this or that type 
of election, election, uh, electoral system. It is that they organize themselves and they have a sense of sharing in the fruits of progress which top-down systems do not have. Mm -hmm. And our viewers can go to your website, which is www.un.org backslash democracy fund and learn much more about your operation and what we're talking about today. Let's talk about specific examples. And I know you're active in many areas, but let's just take a few. For example, uh, one country that's getting a lot of publicity now, unfortunately for the, maybe the wrong reasons, is Syria. And we see the horrific situation going on there with the war and, and also with the, the out-migration of the Syrian refugees, many running for their lives. What types of activities do you have going on in mm -hmm. Syria with, with institutions or with refugees or with uh, any other players? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, we have um, one specific project I want to talk about today, which I am very closely involved with personally, which I visited a few months ago on the Turkish border with Syria, uh, which involves a group of Syrian refugee women who, um, like most Syrian refugees we know and read about, were highly educated, successful professionals at home, but who are now living in a community of 40 to 50,000 refugees and are not able to work in, in the same fully fledged sense mm -hmm. yet. Mm -hmm. However, they have organized themselves into a project which we fund and supervise to start mini projects of their own, such as a legal clinic, because one of them is an attorney, to regularize the papers of fellow refugees in their community, such as a vocational training for young girls who would otherwise risk being married off before the age of 15, such as a women's committee to inform refugees throughout Turkey of opportunities that exist for people like those. Mm -hmm. They will all be brought together in one house for Syrian refugee women to s develop synergies between their various projects and that will then be a model for other places in Turkey and also in other frontline states such as Jordan and Lebanon and maybe also in some parts of Europe that also have large refugee communities now. Okay. Um, this has been very enthusiastically supported by a number of governments when we have proposed it to them and it's one of the most, how can I put this, ways of <coughs> illustrating how people in crisis can mm -hmm. organize themselves and gain a sense of dignity. It transforms them from a statistic to a human being. And that I saw at first hand when I visited the border a few months ago. Mm -hmm. that, that sounds like a very important project. That's a project that would ha require a lot of cultural and political sensitivity, I would think, being involved in it. How did you set that up? How did you get the people involved? Did they apply for your assistance, or did the governments in that area say we need to be uh, more uh, uh, well, proactive or whatever the case might be and uh, help the folks or how, how did that work out? It's a very good question. Um, our proposals for projects do not emanate from governments ever. They are mm -hmm. all proposed by civil society organizations and that's very important to our mission is that it is the voice of civil society that should drive our activity and not, as I said before, from the top down. In this case, it was a civil society organization working locally in that community that proposed it, and then we developed it further. It was initially just a training project. But when we saw how much these women can actually do in practice, which I saw when I visited them a few months mm -hmm. ago, I wanted to get it beyond an exercise on paper to something they can actually do. And therefore, it's entirely their initiative that drives this. And that's, I think, the way mm -hmm. to empower these communities and also ultimately to integrate refugees. Because once they have started with a mission and are functioning as a group, they can then interact much more successfully with the local population. Mm -hmm. I really believe that will happen in Europe too, I Th hope. Exactly. When you said women, I flash back automatically to the UN Millennium Development Goals, which expired December 31st, mm -hmm. 2015. And of course, goal number three was to empower women and promote gender equity. And now the new sustainable development goals to end all poverty, to end uh, hunger, that type of thing. And goal number five, I think, deals with women. How do you bring these 17, maybe not all 17, sustainable development goals into your planning? But you do, you do look at these sustainable development goals and 
the ones that fit into your programs, you mm -hmm. actually incorporate them, mm -hmm. I guess, do you mm -hmm. not? We do, and um, the main theme for our activities going forward this year and next will be ways to bring civil society to bear on the efforts to meet the Sustainable Development Goals in the following way. What is civil society's expertise beyond any other? It is to hold governments accountable to give voice to those who otherwise have no voice and to hold government's feet to the fire, if we can put it like that. So when you have almost 200 governments agreeing to commit to these goals, somebody has to not only monitor them, but hold them responsible for getting there. And that is what we will do now. We will, above all, prioritize proposals that, that um, are designed to confront government, how are you driving this forward, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And I think we can work very much with those parts of the UN that primarily deal with governments in a partnership then that we, we back the civil society side of that equation. Exactly. Well, let's hopscotch from the Middle East and go to Asia and we'll talk about another country you're working in, Myanmar. Mm -hmm. What exactly type mm -hmm. of project mm -hmm. or projects do you have going on in Myanmar? So as we know, Myanmar has just had an election which the world has rightly congratulated the people of Myanmar upon. And what we did, we've done many projects in Myanmar, but the one that stands out right now is one to bring independent critical thinking, especially to young people who are otherwise used to a more spoon-fed educational system. And how did we do that? We did that through a system of debate skills training. Um, they learned to engage in, in political debate uh, on a given number of, of election-related subjects and trained not to rehearse lines and facts, but to engage with each other and develop arguments this way. They also went on a study tour to Estonia, which 25 years ago underwent a, a similar metamorphosis in terms of developing independent thinking after the Soviet Union fell um, and they spent time there breaking out of this boxed way of thinking and uh, I've seen I haven't been there yet I will go in a few months but I've seen videos of their efforts and it was actually really impressive mm -hmm. well you're watching Global Connections television which is a privately funded independently produced program the opinions expressed on Global Connections are solely those of the moderator and his guest we would invite our viewers to go to www.globalconnectionstelevision.com to view previous programs. Also, if you're involved with any media outlets, be it a website or PBS or Community Access Television or a well, college uh, intra television station, whatever it might be, and you have an interest in these programs, p please feel free to go to the website, go to the broadcasters page and download them. They are free of charge and provided as a public service. Today we're taking a look at the UN Democracy Fund and what it's doing to promote democratic activities in various areas of the world. My guest today is the director of the Democracy Fund. My guest today is Ms. Annika Sabel, and Ms. Annika Sabel is the executive head of the UN Democracy Fund. Before we leave Myanmar, talking about debating, this is extremely important to get young people involved in the political process, but to get them involved in it in a rational, logical, civil <coughs> manner and hopefully they will resolve the problems of their country by debating and talking about these issues. But what type of follow-up will you have with these young people as they go on? I'm sure the project will, uh, you'll, you'll have some type of uh, checking to see the effectiveness mm -hmm. of the project, but what type of follow-up mm -hmm. will you have mm -hmm. with them if they're 15 or 18, 20, 21 mm -hmm. now, mm -hmm. and maybe 10, 15 years from now? Aha, uh -huh, so far. <coughs> um, I was going to say um, that like most of our important projects, we will have an evaluation conducted a few years after the project <laughs> starts, um, where we will ask uh, the team of evaluators who are independent of us to, 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 to do um, a, a random following of the participants, we can't do all of them, to see where they have got to. But I think, as you suggest, in the case of Myanmar, we should follow the progress of the country through these individuals as well to see how many of them went on to become members of parliament, senior civil servants, um, leaders of industry, or what have you. And I think that will be an excellent, um, 
uh, an excellent way of evaluating the long term, and, and we hope a success story to tell the story of the UN Democracy Fund as well as the story of Myanmar. Exactly. Now you have other programs going on. One is in the country of Ukraine. What type mm -hmm. of activities do you have in Ukraine? Yes. So in Ukraine, what people hear and read about is um, <coughs> violence and mayhem uh, in various ways. But it's important also to know that there is a very strong effort in the country to decentralize political power um, with um, local councils in each of the regions um, conducting um, much of what used to be centrally controlled. And what we're doing in several projects in Ukraine now for the past three, four years is educating those young councilmen and young councilwomen in things like democratic procedures, parliamentary practices. It's a country like most of the former Soviet Union that has very little strong discipline in how it conducts its parliamentary procedures. And what we're trying to do is use as a vehicle to also maybe promote some greater sense of collaboration among the very polarized groups in Ukraine. And by that I mean, yes, East and West, but also within, I mean, I'm sure you've seen scenes in Ukrainian parliament in the capital where they physically come to blows at times. But there's much that can be said for a more polite way of conducting business that can then actually lead to a substantive understanding between politicians. And so mm -hmm. we are doing that among both men and women who are involved in local politics. Mm -hmm. And again, this was grassroots inspired. This is Proposed. basically local people came up totally. with these ideas. Yes. Very good. These are really diverse projects <laughs> that you're talking about. There's no, yes. it's not a cookie yeah. cutter, one size fits all. Exactly. And that, that's so important because it reflects the various mm -hmm. needs in each country and each society, which are not at all the same. And that goes to underline the fact that democracy is, 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 is so diverse mm -hmm. depending on what the people of the country feel the needs are in, in their particular context. Exactly. And they're, they are the ones who are in the best position yeah. to know what the needs yeah. are, and in many cases, what some of the remedies are, yes. and what they need to actually yeah. be successful. Yes. Well, the last one I was talking about is Tunisia. That's yeah. another country that's yeah. gotten a lot of publicity yeah. from time to time. Mm -hmm. What type of project yeah. do you have running in mm -hmm. Tunisia? Mm -hmm. So Tunisia um, is one of the most important countries in the world for us and any democracy uh, supporting entity to pay attention to right now. Um, we have um, more projects there than in most other countries, I would say, in the past few years. Why is that so important? Because Tunisia is, on the one hand, the only sort of successful example of the Arab Spring five years ago already. It's the only country that hasn't descended into mayhem or renewed authoritarianism. At the same time, Tunisia is the world's largest exporter of jihadism to Islamic State, not just per capita, but in absolute numbers. 6,000 of them, and I'm quoting official statistics, in a small country like that, because young people, especially in the interior of the country where economy is stagnant, have nothing to motivate them at home. And so we must do things there that engage young people in a sense of empowerment, almost a sense of adventure. This is what they need. So projects there can range from, yes, what we usually do, which is um, engaging them in uh, organizing and local participation, but as important or even more so in economic empowerment. Um, that may not seem on the face of it to be UNDEF's normal mission, but there are ways of engendering economic activity locally in these places that will absolutely be crucial to advancing democracy and to a sense of self-esteem that leads to participation in a constructive manner. And I think that more donors and supporters of the region need to pay attention mm -hmm. to that kind of need in Tunisia and also in the countries that border Tunisia, which are also part of the problem now. Exactly. And uh, this whole issue of really youth unemployment 
is a major problem. And one of the, as she mentioned, one of the best ways to deal with this and to help them to achieve their self-actualization and to be productive members of the society is to provide educational and employment opportunities yeah. so they can be really yeah. active members yeah. of the community yeah. and not have a great desire to become jihadist or whatever yes. the case might be. Yes. But this is extremely important. I know Egypt has this problem, but many countries do. Yes. It's not just those two that we're talking about. Yes. So it, it goes far beyond Very that. Much so. Very much so. Um, the countries of the region that were motivated to rise up during the Arab Spring months were all uh, really driven by that kind of frustration that you mm -hmm. describe. In the case of Tunisia, it started with one young man who was uh, university educated but frustrated because he could not get a job in the field that he was educated in. He ran a vegetable cart and that was taken away from him too because he was running it without a license. That started, he set himself on fire, that started the whole uprising in Tunisia and then beyond. But this problem of handing out college diplomas to young people without the employment opportunities mm -hmm. to absorb them is a recipe for disaster, which is what we are seeing now. Uh, and that is what's fueling the, the extremism. Exactly. And this should be a wake-up call for not only governments, but the private sector, yes. too. They have a vested interest in this, and they have to work together. No, one, so. no one team or one group can actually do it by yes. itself. It's very just impossible. So, so very it's very important. Mm -hmm. Before we run out of time, we'll get back into the theoretical for a minute. Let's talk about some of the various types of, and you alluded to this earlier, like uh, what is the difference between a consolidated versus a transitional mm -hmm. democracy? Mm -hmm. I don't want to get too theoretical, mm -hmm. but what, mm -hmm. what is that? And are we living through it with a few countries now? We are living through it with uh, uh, ever fewer countries in terms of transitional countries really being on their way to becoming consolidated. A transitional country is a, a, a nation that is trying to make its way from a totalitarian system to the kind of stable and participatory uh, mm -hmm. society that we have talked about as being the model success story. However, as I said, very few of those that we call transitional now are on their way anywhere except staying in this space, this gray zone as it's sometimes described of competing authoritarianism, increasing nationalism, and importantly, which is something that uh, our fund is on the front lines of, the closing space for civil society. More and more countries are restricting the ability of civil society to operate. There have been more than a hundred pieces of legislation adopted in the past few years in over 50 countries to restrict NGOs from working, mm -hmm. which is one way, isn't it, of imposing this kind of authoritarianism, including in countries that you would probably describe as democracies. This is spread like a virus, starting probably in Eastern Europe, but going through now Africa, Latin America, um, and uh, beyond. So um, this has been a community of worst practices, if I can see, instead of community of best practices. And they don't need to do much research to just copy each other to see what works in terms of limiting this space. Exactly. And what, what can we do about that? I know you're trying with some of your programs. Are there other things mm. that maybe we can be done, either by the UN, by the civil society, by various groups? Well, the countries are their own bosses. So there's very little you can do in terms of uh, official pressure in this way. But I think you have to find crafty ways of supporting civil society to operate in ways that don't seem so threatening to governments and try and have a dialogue uh, with specificity about what this or that NGO is trying to do such that a government will understand that it is possible to have a strong state and a strong civil society at the same time. Again, that is what characterizes the stable, successful nations of this world. They have a hundred year history of strong government and mm -hmm. strong grassroots organization, both working together for economic advancement and stability. Mm -hmm. And not be a threat to the government. Correct. Working in tandem yes. for a common goal yes. to benefit the society. Yes. Uh, last question, probably the hardest one there in the last minute we have. What do you see as a major challenge mm -hmm. for the UN Democracy Fund as you move forward with your projects in the mm -hmm. countries you mentioned and maybe some new mm -hmm. projects? Mm -hmm. So, obviously, this um, 
trend towards closing space of civil society is a direct challenge for us. We work, as I say, on the front lines of that, but we uh, have to develop in innovative ways of getting through and mm -hmm. around these restrictions. That's um, on the one hand in the so-called uh, transi transitional democracies. On the other hand, another challenge for us is that among many of the so-called Western democracies, there is less and less of a priority accorded to democracy support. Um, they are, um, in many cases, not seeing the link between development taking hold in the Global South and participatory democracy taking hold in the Global South. As I've described in many of my answers today, there is an absolute link, but that's not being recognized by the West that are setting the agenda. Exactly. Well, Anna Kosavo with the UN Democracy Fund, very important topics, and we're going to learn a lot more about it in the future, but I want to thank you so very much for a very interesting and a very informative program. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. I'm Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us today on Global Connections Television. <laughs> <laughs>